Um, really excited. We have not had Tim Basin, a, a good buddy of mine, come to town, uh, partly because he was banned from Nashville for a while that was just lifted. So we're excited that that is uh, gone. But um, you know, we've done a lot of different things with this, this conference, and the last two presentations are going to be definitely more business oriented. And when you talk about entrepreneurship and business models and consulting uh, in those genres, you're not going to find a person who's more knowledgeable uh, or more dedicated to those areas than this guy right here. So I'm excited Tim is here with us. Thanks. Tim, thanks, buddy. Cheers. All righty. How's everybody? I am not as, um, as active as my friend Sean Drake during these presentations. So I'm not going to sort of have you up and stretching, but I do want us to stimulate some very real thoughts about our industry, our careers, and how we go about our day-to-day -day business. A little bit about me. I'm a tennis coach. To prove it, even after all these years, just last two weeks ago, I had a player that made last eight out of 12 play courts. I'm just like every single person in this room. Um, one thing I can test I do better than anybody else, is I refuse to do things just the way they've always been done. And that really is the message that we'll get as we talk through these six steps. In 2001, I came to the US, I played college tennis. Uh, I live and am based in the Washington DC area. Uh, in 2006, I started teaching tennis for $9 an hour for a clinic and $14 an hour for a private lesson. That's in DC. It's not very sustainable. I quickly recognized that I wanted to be a coach, I wanted to be in tennis, but there had to be other avenues in order for me to sustain this and be successful. For myself as a coach initially, to be able to pay my bills, to be able to put some money away for a rainy day, I didn't have benefits, I didn't have health care um, 401k as part of my job, I didn't have paid time off. In 2007, I went to my first symposium at the PTR. I slept in my car, couldn't afford a hotel. <coughs> and the reason I'm telling you all of this is to tell you that my journey has been honestly very much living and breathing every obstacle that exists in the tennis industry. I went on to create Blue Chip Sports Management, it's a multi-million dollar company. Uh, I stepped down running that in 2015. And I've been devoting a lot of my time since then to sort of sharing some of the messages and some of the experiences that I know have made myself and a whole host of investors and partners and coaches that work for me successful and trying to share that with all of you. So please keep an open mind. What we're going to talk about today, the six steps to entrepreneurial success for tennis coaches, is not proprietary. I didn't make this stuff up. These are just things that I know that if you utilize every single day of your life, you will be very, very successful in anything that you do. And that's the point. So firstly, in our mission, I get that everybody in this room is coming from a different stance. Okay? Maybe you're a club pro. Maybe you're a director, a GM. Maybe you're just getting started. Maybe you're a high school coach. Maybe you work for USTA. Okay? I understand there are many different avenues in which we work and operate in the tennis industry. These steps are completely transferable no matter whether you're a one-person show or whether you own and operate multiple facilities. All right, so without further ado, let's get going. Um, here are some of my clients just to prove that I'm not full of hot air. Okay, so the business of tennis. Any good tennis player is able to adjust their strategy to win a match. Every single person in this room is a tennis player, okay? And I think it would be fair to say a decent tennis player, right? Some of you may have played on tour, some collegiately. When we play a sport, we're able to adjust our strategy and our thinking in order to win the match. In the tennis industry, we have to think the same way. As coaches, we have got to adjust our strategy beyond the way things are currently done. Because I'm telling you, if you think that our sport and our industry is growing, we've got another thing coming. We have to take a close look at some of the things we don't do well and try and change those things. So we talk about the entrepreneurial spirit. 
Uh, I have someone who said to me, Tim, you're a, you're a born entrepreneur. What does that mean? I didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur. Like I said earlier, my only thing that I think I'm good at is questioning the status quo as to why we do certain things. But being entrepreneurial is very simple. What incentivizes you? I'm going to be the first person to tell you, money incentivizes me, right? I want to own something. I want to stay in tennis, but I want to make sure that I can provide for myself, my family, uh, and have opportunities, right? So we can't shy away from that. Too many times coaches are like, oh, I teach tennis, I'm so passionate, I'm so passionate. Yeah, that's great, but are you making any money? Because if you're not, the industry's not sustainable. Clubs don't get built, okay? Uh, coaches don't stay for 40 years careers, and that's a problem. Define what you want and establish a plan to get it. As coaches, with our players, the best coaches in the world, have unbelievably good developmental plans with every single X and O that comes with a player going from A to B is marked out and followed to the letter. As coaches, how many of you are goal setting? How many of you are setting goals for your careers? Where do you want to be? Six months, one year. How many of you are mandating that your teams, your staff that work for you are doing the same thing? These are the sort of things that are going to make you successful. Constantly audit yourself. Um, in the past 18 months, I've been on three continents speaking, and I've done, I think, 30-odd speaking gigs since February. I need to make sure I audit myself, okay? If you're putting yourself out there in any capacity, and as a coach, just by trade you are, you're in a service business, you need to make sure that you're taking a close look at how you operate. From all the obvious stuff, from how you dress, and whether you're, you know, um, uh, I don't know, beards tidy or clean shaven, whatever it may be. As you get out and you do more in the industry, because this is one thing I'm going to challenge you all to do, is every single person here has a duty to get out and share the knowledge and information that you know. Okay? There is nothing proprietary about how to successfully build a tennis business. Okay? As coaches, we can sometimes very much internalize things, keep things within the four walls of our club, and not necessarily communicate well. So the thing I'm going to say first is, as you leave here today, Every single person here, make sure that you have met every other person in this conference. Make sure that you have connected with them, whether it's phone, message, LinkedIn, Facebook. Open up a dialogue that is going to do two things. One, make the information that makes us all better translate better, okay? And secondly, it's going to give you an opportunity to grow your network, your brand, which we'll talk about. Entrepreneurs are people who identify a need, any need, and they work to fill it. Entrepreneurship is a primordial, a primordial urge that's independent of product, service, industry, or market. Who here believes, show of hands, that coaches, that a coach, say a coach at a club, that that coach is responsible for bringing business in? Show of hands. Or who thinks it's the responsibility of the club? So. Who's, who's, who's the coach? Coach's responsibility. And who thinks it's the club's responsibility? Okay. I will contest that it's the coach's responsibility. Okay. It's a mindset that we have to have as coaches. And that's, that really does buy into the entrepreneurial bit. We're out there. We're in the sales business. Okay. We have to put products before cash. We have to make sure that our product is so good that people are going to be lining up wanting to do it. That is not the responsibility of the club. The responsibility of the club is to give you a safe haven in which to have your product executed. Right? So coaches, every time that you are out and about, wherever you may be, is an opportunity to bring people into your network. So, the six steps. Branding. How will you stand out? Networking. How will I find new customers and partners? Just as a side note, um, after this presentation, that one in particular on networking, I did a webinar for the TIA and USPTA, and it's on um, uh, creating, sustaining, and leveraging partnerships. And uh, so that's just, if you guys afterwards want a little bit more information. Mentoring. How are you going to give back? Data analytics. Why is he talking about data? This is tenants. Data analytics, okay? 
how are you going to understand what works for you, your business, and tennis overall? Leadership and management training. I'm a member of the PTR and the USPTA. They have done an awful lot for me in my careers, okay? But we are paying members of these organizations. It's the same as lobbying your congressman. We must, as members, contact these organizations to get help and to get the information that we need, okay? Again, it's very easy for us to, um, you know, I've heard someone say, well, you really get in what you, what, get out, get it, sorry, get out of it what you put in, and that's very true, right? But USPTA, PTR, USTA, they work for us, right? We are the paying members. We are the ones that if we want something uh, covered, if we want some source of information, if we want that person to be a speaker, let them know. Customer service. How will I keep my clients happy? Warren Buffett, he uh, knows a few things about making a dollar. Your premium brand had better be delivering something special or it's not going to get the business. Brand, brand, brand. Start thinking of yourself as a brand. My name is Tim Bainton. I am a brand. My company is Blue Chip Sports Management. That is a brand. If you look at Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola is the parent company, the brand. Sprite, Fanta, all of them underneath. If you are an individual pro by yourself, your brand better be out there and it better be airtight. Okay, so make sure you're thinking of yourself as a brand. If you're in a club, this is something I have an issue with. A lot of directors and GMs, and I can say that because I've been one, they do not push the pros and the coaches underneath them to be their own individual brands, right? The more powerful those brands are, the better off you're gonna be from the top down, okay? Develop a compelling personal story. I started teaching tennis for nine dollars an hour. I slept in my car at my first conference, right? These are true omissions that I am proud of. And that's something that all of us need to do. We are in the service business. We are not in the subservient business. When you have a client, that client will stay with you if they are compelled by your story. I had a coach one time that worked for us who didn't want to put in his bio on the website that he only started, uh, started playing tennis at 17 years of age. He was embarrassed by it. In your day-to-day -day life, how many of us are working with the number one player in the world? Your core, your core membership, your core audience are that person, that coach. It doesn't mean you're not good at what you do. People can relate. We all make this mistake of poster or posterizing the best junior that we have and forgetting everybody else in our program. The more people, the more your brand and your stories that you can put together to support that, that relate to a much wider audience, is only going to make you more successful. Okay? Have a mission statement. Create presence and authority that we recognize outside of the industry. I am a true believer that tennis is the greatest sport in the world, but we do not work in the greatest industry. And we have to collectively change that. If um, become known for producing value and solve problems, find your niche. Would you say that Sean's got a niche in the tennis industry right now? I would. Doing very well with it. Find your niche. So we said, you've got to have a story. Don't be afraid to tell your story. It's your most valuable asset. In communicating with anybody, our story allows us to strike an emotional connection. <coughs> right? An emotional connection that will keep that client coming to your court. That will keep the kids of the client coming to your court. And keep that client going out into the world and telling people about you and your story and that you are the best coach around. It's not how many people you know, it's how many people want to know you. That's a, the issue here. We cannot sit on our hands and think that I've got enough. The tennis industry needs everybody to go out and make it a point of sharing your passion, your love, your drive with everybody from the barista at Starbucks to the CEO that we are tennis coaches and we want you to know about us and what we've got going on. talked about finding your niche. If you're working in a club setting, 
one of the big issues that exist is we have a broken model. How can you have a 40-year career in any business and these are the rungs of promotion? A system pro, hope to God you become the head pro. If you're the head pro, you hang on in that because you don't really bring anyone up underneath you because you're so hoping you can become the director one day. Become the director, take it a little casual, make the money you think you would, would do for all these years, retire. If this was in a Fortune 500 company, or the military, or government, four rungs of promotion, and not even guaranteed promotion. So the reason why I talk about niche is very simple. That model is broken. The way we change it is by having coaches and operators that absolutely are well versed in everything that's in the tennis industry. But you find a niche. What is it you're good at? And that, therefore, can be an avenue for a promotion with a title that's maybe a little bit uncharacteristic to what we do in the tennis industry. Uh, it allows you to have ownership, potentially, over a certain division or a group or a new initiative. This is the sort of way that we need to be thinking, finding your niche. Networks. Everybody here will get a business card. I give out 5,000 business cards a year, OK? You're thinking, well, Tim, why do you go to the effort of giving all these business cards out? How many people truly come into your club and your business? Good point. Not many. But if you give out 5,000, guess what? You'll get a good enough hit rate to grow your business and your bottom line. But what's most important is when you give out a business card, not only do you strike a human interaction, okay? I call it handshakes and smiles, okay? Hey, Dan, how are you? Nice hey, to meet you? you. Dan, where do you coach? Charlotte. Charlotte, okay. How are you having a good day? Yep. What do you love about teaching? Just sharing my passion. Awesome, dude. Can I get your business card too? Yeah. Cool, excellent. So the thing is, is this. We have to put ourselves out there. Every day that you're awake, think of the stuff that we don't promote ourselves in our business. Picking your kids up from daycare, going to Starbucks, going to a gym, going to the movie theater, I don't know. All of these are opportunities where you have human interaction. It's not to sell somebody something. I wouldn't go up to Dan and say, Dan, here's my business card, please buy from me. I want you to know about me. I want you to know about the business. And I want to know about you. I want you to be a person in my network and a point of referral. And somebody that I would hopefully consider a business acquaintance potentially further along or just a friend. You cannot ever have a shortage of those sort of people. Through your network, another thing I can test. Tennis should be the greatest industry to work in because our little black book, our Rolodex, our iPhone, is filled with some of the most wealthy, educated, powerful people around. And that comes back to my statement. We are not in, we are in the service business, not the subservient business. And if as coaches we have great ambition, those people will help you. How many of you have gone to a fancy home of one of your clients for Thanksgiving or Christmas because you teach their kids and they love you? You have that emotional connection. And the, I don't know, the, the wife's a doctor and the husband's a big time lawyer. And guess what? You can't afford his legal fees, but you honestly think he wouldn't help you out if you ask? This is about on its basic level. And we think about it beyond that. Everybody, every, my investors in our companies, my doctor, my lawyer, everybody is a client or a referral, referral of a client. Everybody. What you have in your phone, the people that you know, should allow, as long as you do it correctly and with integrity, should allow you to have unlimited resources and potential ambition. Uh, okay. How are we doing? Good? Opportunities for networking. I'll glaze over this. Jenny's, Jenny, my buddy Jenny over there is the expert. But today, in today's day and age, I don't really love it, but I, I do it. I see the benefit. You gotta be out there in social media. You gotta be on LinkedIn, you gotta be on Facebook, you gotta be on Instagram, you gotta be on Twitter. You gotta have a great website, okay? These are things that I do not find easy, okay? I don't really always enjoy them. For those of you who've seen my posts on Facebook, I post in Tennis House a lot, I post questions. And you know why I post questions? Because I want the industry to get better, and I have a seat at the table in order to make the industry better, and therefore, I, it's a source of research. I want to know what's going on in coaches' lives. I want to know some of the problems. I want to know how I can help. I want to know what you're doing well and what you're not. If more people did that, okay, we would have a better dialogue in which to make adjustments to our industry. But social media is huge. 
So, make sure you always carry business cards. Have a tight brand on that business card, okay? If you're an independent contractor or a one-person show, your brand is so vital to you, okay, in growing your business. If you're in a club, okay, you're a bit protected maybe, but where's your level of ambition, right? Mentoring. One of the greatest values of mentors is the ability to see ahead what others cannot see and help them navigate a course to their destination. I've been very fortunate in my career to have a lot of good people help me and guide me. I didn't really at the time recognize that they were mentors. So I'm looking back and, you know, and don't get me wrong, I've made many, every mistake in the book to get where I was. Okay, but I've always made a point of learning and there's some really good people that helped me and guided me. Every single person in this room, make sure today, if you have done already, that you know who your mentors are. And if you need somebody, seek that person out. Again, like I said, just go into your phone. I guarantee you, if you have a certain area that you need help in, I guarantee you, you teach a parent somewhere, right, that will have that expertise and they'll help you, okay? In having a mentor, it aligns, aligns yourself with good patrons. In identifying who those mentors are is extremely important so that you can uh, approach them and have uh, consistent dialogue and things that you'll help working with. And be a mentor. I didn't think of myself as a mentor. And I have a staff, of, at one point I had a staff of 50 coaches, right? So I had to start thinking of myself as a mentor, okay? There are other speakers and people in this room that I look to as mentors, whether they realize it or not. People that I learn from, people that I respect. Make yourself accessible. The PTR just launched a mentoring um, program and the USPTA I know just launched their leadership academy. There are a lot of positive things that should have been around for years, but that's just the way it is, that are helping our industry, okay? But let's dumb it down and localize it here right now. As you leave today, by making a connection with someone new, by sharing your experiences, you guys open a dialogue, you can mentor each other. I have a mentor in this, the PTR program. He's 22 years of age and lives in Kansas. I'm supposed to be the mentor. Every time we get on a conversation, I learn something new. Okay? It's a two-way street. But in being a mentor, you have to make yourself accessible. The speakers that get up and don't make themselves accessible, that don't share their content freely, these people aren't good mentors to the industry. Having an opinion, but you must be a great listener. My wife will tell you that these are things I have had to work on. But once I started to listen better to my staff and to other people in the industry, man, we got some work done, okay? And I learned and became better for it. Listening helps you form great opinions, be open to ideas and suggestions. And then my favorite thing, I've been there, I remember about five, six years ago, if I didn't win the USTA Mid-Atlantic Pro of the Year, I was heartbroken. Who the hell cares, right? If we're gonna make this industry better, we have to celebrate the success of the other coaches and the people coming up in the pipelines. The coaches that work for us. I bring this up all the time and I've done it on three different continents. I've got a 23-year-old coach called Kelly Sykes who was the PTR Young Professional of the Year. We posterize that stuff, okay? I am so proud of him, it's not even funny. I've got another pro who was the youngest person to ever complete the USTA High Performance Program. These are things that I will talk about as a badge of honor because it helps promote them, it helps increase their brand, and it helps me, as the, as the boss, look better. I don't want to win awards, I don't need awards. What I need is other coaches coming up in the pipeline that I hopefully can help guide their success. And the more of us that have that attitude, the better off we're all gonna be. Continuing education. As I said, a couple of things I got right. I don't know how, maybe just luck. I've always had a thirst for information. Uh, I've looked, I've studied so many other industries. I've made points of going and shadowing people who run restaurants and how to get the blueprint down, for example, in running a successful health club. I work with data analytics companies in order to get the, the, the footprint in which we operate better and tighter. Everybody, step outside of your, step outside the lines of the court. 
and educate yourself as to how other things, other, other people in other industries are doing things well. Continuing education is massive. However, even this conference right now, which I'm extremely humbled to be invited to talk at, every single person has to leave this conference and make sure you give feedback. Make sure you make suggestions as to who you want to hear talk next year and why. Make sure you take the information, you follow up with the speakers, you create that network, that alliance. Because at the end of the day, you're spending your hard-earned money, you're here, you're not on the court, you're not making money. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the truth for literally 90% of coaches in the country. Okay? So I commend you for doing it. And like I said, I've been there. I slept in my car. I couldn't afford a hotel. We have got, we have got to demand the educational standards improve. And the only way that happens is by speaking up. But not just speaking up, but also by making yourselves part of the education process. Every single person in here Again, I'll challenge you. If you've never spoken at a conference, I say, why not? I'm sure you've got something valuable to offer, and I want to hear it. I'm sick and tired of hearing to the same people all of the time. We want new content, new information, and we need to hear it. And the only way that happens is for people to submit, okay? Submit articles, submit proposals to present, submit ideas for round tables or mini conferences. There's endless possibilities but every single person in this room needs to do it. In order to do that, we create, and I'm always wary when someone refers to me as an industry leader because I'm, I don't know, I'm constantly trying to learn and get better. I don't pretend to know it all. Is we need more people involved in curating the information. It's that simple, okay? And everybody has an opinion and a voice, and they need to make sure it's heard. Steve Jobs. Great things in business are never done by a person, they're done by a team of people. My company got better once I stopped trying to be the sole brain child behind it. Okay? Once I started getting ideas from all of my other staff, everybody from the front desk up to even some of the housekeeping people, I want to hear what you think. I want to curate that information. I go to other industries, I constantly learn. Steve Jobs was a master. He never ever physically created a product. He had an idea, and then he got the smartest people in the world to come and build it for him. And he's the one that would get up there at their annual address and is the rock star, okay? It's the same when you run a tennis club. If you're the director or the GM, you need to have great open dialogue with everybody that's in your operation, okay? And make sure you take the time to listen to that and curate it. With this, I know the US, USPTA just had their Leadership Academy. Um, that's a really exciting uh, step. Uh, as coaches, look, there was no coaching manual for me that taught things as to how to be a great leader and manager. But that information is so readily available. And if you think all coaching is is hitting tennis balls, you've got another thing coming, okay? If you want to have sustained success in this industry, you have to be a great manager, operator, and leader. So what are some of these things? With regards to management, creating inclusive institutions. At my clubs, everybody at the front desk, the front desk staff, know what our financial goals are that month. They get bought in. We want them. We want them to know that they are, we are in this together, okay? Clearly articulating organizational strategy. Provide regular and structured feedback. Encourage innovation. I was on a call on the way up here from a guy that's called me up and they're creating a kind of a mini version of PlaySite. He was telling me about it on the phone, and it's exciting, right? But that's, that's the technology aspect. Let's be more innovative in how we do our day-to-day -day business, how we go about it, how we interact with people, okay? If you're doing things the way they were done 40 years ago in the tennis industry, you are dying. It's that simple, okay? So make sure that we are much more optimistic and, and, and sorry, not optimistic, 
much more driven to encourage innovation from our staff. One thing I do every single week, okay, every single week my staff will come to their annual, their, their weekly meeting and it's like an episode of the show Shark Tank. They must come and they must pitch the group on an idea. An idea to maybe make money or to operate better, whatever it may be. But it creates innovative thought and it holds people accountable and it makes our operation stronger. Just a simple idea that we can all do. Running your business. Apply corporate standards. If you're, a, if you're, a, there's a reason why Fortune 500 companies are Fortune 500 companies. They're tight, well-oiled machines for the most part. Be the future, not the present. Create sustainable income streams. Now, in tennis. If you work, there's a, there's a, a business school that I did, there's a, uh, there's a theory, it's the theory of 75,000. Now I acknowledge that 75,000 in one part of the US as a coach compared to another, I, I get it, apples and oranges. But just bear with me. In order to make $75,000 a year, you must work 40 hours a week on the court. We're going to assume there's no salary, there's no other sustainable streams. You're just coaching. You must work 40 hours on the court every single week at a rate of $36.06 an hour for 52 weeks of the year. Anyone see a problem there? We laugh, but that's pretty much the reason why we don't keep more people in this industry. Okay? The economics behind it don't necessarily add up. Now, how do we change that? You have got to find ways to innovate and create sustainable, passive, and growth mechanism income streams beyond just teaching. That will help, the, if you're an individual, that obviously helps you. If you're a club or part of a club, that helps the club, it helps the club grow, it helps opportunity grow, and that is the way we must be thinking and operating. Data analytics. So, as I said, in 2015, I stopped running Blue Chip, um, took a back seat, and I was you know, pretty happy with the work we'd done. And then, completely by luck, a friend of mine comes to DC, and being a nice guy, I said, hey, let me help you out with some clients and stuff, because he's starting a new company. I'm like, what's the company? He goes, it's called Data Society. We teach progressive data analytics to big business. What on earth is that? No idea. But being a nice guy, I sort of hung around him and I helped him set up his shop and I would introduce him to some people that I knew in my Rolodex, my phone. And I started to see the operation and the way that he did things differently. I refer to it as seeing, uh, seeing it through the data lens. I started to question every single thing that we did and why we did it. Not just in my work, even in my personal life. Where is the data behind why we are doing things? Who's seen the movie Moneyball? Or familiar with the real story, obviously? Billy Bean. Firstly, I know you think it's funny that a Brit's talking about baseball, but it's a genius, genius concept that they, that they executed. Billy Bean, obviously, GM of the Oakland A's, applied, applied data analytics in how they valued players. As we know, the Oakland A's went on to a 23-game win streak, which at the time was the longest in MLB history. The Boston Red Sox, I believe a decade later, won the World Series after a long drought using the same formula. And now this is standard at every, at, for every baseball scout anywhere in the country. When Billy Bean took that risk as the leader of the Oakland A's, Every single day, until they had that success, he risked getting fired. He stood out from the crowd, he took the scouts on, he challenged the status quo, and he changed the game. He changed the way that we do things. We all in tennis and in coaching must be that change agent. We must be that person that is willing to take the risk to lead and to therefore to move the needle. So the basics of data. Data has no intrinsic value. It's been around since the dawn of time. 
but the key is the leadership, how we use that data. Show of hands, who has a front or back office software that they work with? Who has an online court booking system? Show of hands. Every, everybody, surely, yes? Even if you're an independent contractor and you're just teaching on a single court and you have the Square app, right? And that's how you take your payments or through PayPal. Every single one of these provides data. Every single one of them. How many people, show of hands, survey your clients and your membership? That's alarming. Everybody should. How else do you know what people are thinking? Okay? My point is this. Who can tell me why, why, why we teach a one-hour private lesson? It's pretty standard, right? Why do we teach a one-hour private lesson? Exactly. Where is the reasoning and the data behind anything? We do it because that's the way it's always been done. Once I started to take this data lens to my day-to-day -day business, I already have the information. I have the point of sale. I have the back office software. I have the court booking sheets. We survey our members. But when's the only time I ever used it? When somebody complains. That's a reactive mechanism, not a proactive one. So I started to look into the data, and here are some simple things that anybody can do. How important do you think it is to be extremely good with your marketing dollars? Right? Okay? You don't want to waste money or just throw dollars here and hope something sticks. By a simple zip code analysis in software that I already had, our club in Alexandria, I was able to find out that 85% of our membership live within a 3.82 mile radius. Tim, what's the point of knowing that, dude? Seriously. Because that's where my captive audience is. We were able to understand traffic patterns and getting to the club. It was able to tell us when and when not to schedule classes based on when people could get there. Not just putting a class at four o'clock because that's when kids get out of school. Being much more specific and deliberate. I'll tell you another one. When people check into our facility, okay, check-in data, our front desk staff would usually, this is what would happen. At part of the day, they're swamped, not giving good customer service because the foot traffic is so much, okay? And then at maybe a different part of the day, I'd walk past and I'd be like, they're just on their iPhone chilling. What am I paying them for? This attitude and this thinking is wrong. By looking closely at check-in data, we were able to curate a, um, a, uh, a to-do list for them that wasn't just a to-do list. It was broken down literally from the day and the hour that that club was open. That level of accuracy makes them a better employee, makes us a better operator, but most importantly, means that the customer service delivered to our paying customers is the highest it can be. I'm not a data scientist, okay? I told you the true story. I got lucky, a friend of mine just changed the way I thought. But as someone that had a thirst for knowledge and was consciously trying to be a good leader, I listened and I changed the way I did things. And I'm telling you, our revenues have grown 30% since 2015. When you hear about clubs closing and people getting out of the industry for X, Y, and Z, not us. And this is a big component as to why. In fact, probably the main one. Okie dokie. So, um, again, Jenny obviously is the social media expert. How many of you use Facebook to promote yourself or your club? Okay. If you, put a, if you put a picture up there that's just a Thanksgiving turkey that's a generic stock picture off Google, which I see most clubs do, happy Thanksgiving from X club, it gets one pity like. I don't even, I don't even put pity like on it. If I, if I see something like that, I actually write in the comment box, charity like. That's my contribution, right? The thing is this, it kind of goes back to auditing your presence. We have to use these mechanisms. There is absolutely no way around it. But you have to be very clever when, so, sorry, careful when something doesn't work. I post a lot on Facebook, right? But if it doesn't get the interaction that I want, I will go back and look at it. I will analyze. I will stink to myself because I thought it was a good idea, clearly. I wouldn't have posted. I think any of us post something if we didn't think it was a good idea. But I will go back and I will closely look and analyze it because we need to have the data to support in this mechanism as to what, as, it's kind of as to what we're doing and verifying what we're doing. So if you say, for example, post on Facebook in a little video of a, of a new clinic that you've got and it gets 50, 60 likes and members are engaged, that's fantastic, right? So make sure you are aware of the data that you get from social media, it's very important. 
So, these are questions that, like I said, I'll share this with everybody anyway, but some real food, food for thought. How are you making your money? If it is just on the court, you have to start trying to find other creative avenues in which to do so. As both an individual coach teaching by themselves in the club, do you know what your acquisition cost is? Okay? How much does it cost you? How much time and effort to bring a client in? Okay? And keep that customer. How is it that you market your services? How are you spending your time? Another thing that data analytics taught me was just mind blown. I, and this is something, this, this, it's no real, uh, it's, anyone can do it. I got all my staff together and I said, look, write down the list of the top 10 people that take up your time on a weekly basis. Write them down, okay? I did the same experiment. You know, the people that complain a lot, or maybe they take 10 lessons from you, the, write down in whatever capacity the 10 people that take up the most time. I then went and ran a report for every one of those 10 people that every single person mentioned, right? And I ran a report annually on how much revenue they brought in, okay? It was like this. People taking up my time compared to what they were spending. People spending, people taking up my time, okay? These are simple things. Be very aware of where you are spending your time, okay? Do you know which clients will leave you? If somebody comes and joins your club, now a beautiful country club like this, look, I get it, it's different. You join a country club like this, it's because it's for life, it's for the family and everything. But in the business of tennis, we need to have that same thing. If somebody joins your a class, say you have an, an eight week beginner clinic, and after three weeks, someone's not coming up, they're not coming anymore, we haven't heard from them. Do you just consider them lost? Or are you going to take the time to reach out and be proactive to get them back in? Okay? We lose a lot of customers because of disengagement. We know tennis is a hard sport to play. We know it takes a lot of time. Okay? It can take a lot of money too. I understand these things. But we cannot, anytime we have someone come into our business, we cannot lose them to disengagement. Okay? I'm actually this guy's tennis coach, by the way. Don't believe me, it's on my Facebook page. Um, your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning, Mr. Gates. Okay? Customer service. You must have a quality product or service. As tennis coaches, I often see people put cash first. Come buy 10 lessons off me. Come on, 10 lessons. Got the cash. The product will dictate how successful you are. Okay, I am telling you from my own experience, if your product is airtight, you can charge what you want. There is a reason the Apple iPhone X is $1,200 and Apple just reached a trillion dollars in stock. It is because people will pay for quality, okay, and innovation. So we must understand that. Put your customers first and be very genuine with it. Time is not on your side, okay. So make sure that everything you do is customer driven, customer first driven. So in putting this together, opportunities don't happen, you create them, right? And never be satisfied. Be proactive to achieve growth. There is too many reactionary things have happened in tennis. Someone says, oh, my club's not doing very well now. Oh, I might go out of business. Oh, I might not. I might go and try a different career. These are reactionary measures. If you're proactive to what you want, remember what I said at the start, coaches, be very, very diligent in setting your goals and where you want to be in your career. We do it for our players, why don't we do it for us? <clears throat> Collaborate with others. This is absolutely massive. Collaboration is king, okay? It's not meant to be a plug. I've got a new book coming out. I'm not trying to sell it to you. I'll give it all to you for free, I promise. But in that book, I've got 12 guest chapters. When I called those 12 people up, I was like, oh, do you think they'll say yes? Every single person, right? Now, the point is this. It's reaching across the aisle, okay, in order to try and get the dialogue going. Collaboration is key. 
I said about people writing articles or getting up and speaking, if it's something that doesn't come very naturally to you, which I completely appreciate, collaborate with someone. Do it with a teammate, right? Get up and do something together. My point is, it's about having the open dialogue in order to make our industry better. Build partnerships inside and outside of the tennis industry. Like I said, the more people talking about tennis, the better off we are. If every single one of you gave out 5,000 business cards a year, just for one year, every single, if every single coach in the country did it, to 5,000 people that they have never had on their tennis court before, do you honestly not think we've moved the needle? Right? It's a collective effort. Not one person can do it by themselves. Be aware of industry trends. Things are changing. They need to change. Other industries do things well. Make sure you onboard them. If they don't work, don't use them. Very simple. Build yourself, your team, and maximize your sorry, build yourself, your team, and business and maximize potential. Your takeaways. Create systems for growth for yourself and for your team. Constantly be innovating in how you are doing things. Solve problems, build trust, create positive experiences for clients and staff. And this is the best, and it doesn't matter if you are an independent person by yourself in a public park. Run your operation like a world-class company. I'm not in the business of selling you anything. I have a free ebook. It's free. You don't go on there and get tricked. It's free. Okay? I'm going to have a series of ebooks coming out to help the industry. One every two months. I work with a writing partner of mine uh, who's written for Forbes and some other big you know, Vanity Fair and stuff. So I'm very lucky with that. And we crank out some, hopefully, some good literature. Um, the first one is about how to successfully sustain and raise your rates as a coach. It's available on timbainton.com. I know that's a lot, it's a pleasure, and I appreciate everyone's time. Any questions?